Hello dear chess friends, I'm international master Andrei Ostrovsky and you're welcome to the series of lessons dedicated to keen and pawn endgames. In this one we're going to discuss the very important topic of the opposition. So in this given position we can see that white has a material advantage, it is the extra pawn. It is the single pawn that is present on the board, so white's plan is clear, white wants to promote it to a queen and then to checkmate a pawn in scheme with the help of the king and the queen. So what to do to promote this pawn? We can see that uh, opponent's king, black king, occupies very good position in front of this pawn actually. And uh, basic defense will be just to blockade this pawn. So whenever this pawn goes further and further, the king stays in front of it and blockades it. So to ensure the promotion of this pawn, white has to fight for the space to grab the control over key squares and to try to kick this king away. So, king to d5. And this specific placement of the kings is called the opposition. So, opposition is the situation when the kings are placed in front of each other and there is an odd quantity of squares between them. So, here we have only one square, it is d6, and black's turn to move, which means that white gained the opposition. What does it mean? White definitely benefits from it, because now it doesn't matter where the king goes, white's king grabs the control over key squares. For instance, if king goes to e7, then white gets to c6 square. And now we can see that white controls more squares on the way of the pawn, right? So now d5, d6 and d7 are controlled. So after, let's say, king to e6, white plays d5, and after king e7, white plays king to c7. And now we can see that d6, d7, and d8 squares are controlled by white's king. So this pawn goes to the promotion square without limits, right? So white simply promotes to a queen and wins the game. The same happens after, let's say, king to c7. So now king goes to the other side, it is e6 square, and the same method. So king c6, d5, king c7, and king e7. Let's have a look what happens if black stays on the d-file with the king. Let's say after king d5, black plays king to e7, and after king c6, instead of moving towards the pawn, right, allowing white to play d5, black plays king to d8, uh, hoping to blockade this pawn. But after that, white gains the opposition once again, it is king to d6 move. So if king goes to e8 in this situation, then king simply occupies c7. And now pawn automatically goes to d8 square after king e7 and d5. Nothing can help black here. If king goes to the c8 after king d6, it also doesn't help because of king e7, king c7, and again d5, and pawn goes towards the d8 square. So, just to underline the importance of the opposition and to show you that king d5 was really the only move that led to a win, let's have a look on other moves. So, what if white simply plays king to e5, another square? Does it make a difference? Yes, it does, because now king goes to e7 and black gains the opposition. That's the big difference. You know, white can't really make a progress. Let's say king to d5, king to d7, king to c5, king to c7. And black still controls most important squares, so white can't really win the space. White can't grab the control over important squares to ensure the promotion of the pawn and actually forced to push this pawn. But what happens after that? Black has no problems with staying on the D file and blockading this pawn. Let's say king to D7, D6, king goes to D8. Very important move. So that's after king C6, black gains the opposition again. King goes to C8. And after D7 check, king goes to D8. And after king D6, it is a stalemate. By the way, it is a very important theoretic position just to memorize and to use this knowledge over the board. So when your king is not in front of the pawn, you can't really win this position.
For example, after d5, we have the same pattern. So king goes to d6. We can see that white's king is not in front of the pawn, but behind it. And in this case, it is not possible to kick a pawn's king away. So after king d7, king e5, king e7, d6, king d7, king d5, but gradually uh, proceeds with the plan, right? So the pawn moves further and further, but it doesn't really help. So here it is important to play exactly king to d8, not to e8 or c8. And after king e6, king e8, d7 check, king d8, and king d6, it is a stalemate. Just to make you know what happens if black doesn't play king d8, let's have a look on this position. So after king d5, if black, let's say, plays king to e8, it is very bad because now king goes to e6. And after king d8, white plays d7 without check. So now black's turn to move. And after king c7 and king e7, white manages to promote a pawn. The same happens after, let's say, king d5 and king uh, c8. So white can move the king to e6 or c6. It doesn't really matter here. So let's say king to e6. And after king d8, again, the same d7. And white gets the control over e7 square. But after correct king d8, white can't make a progress. So to grab the space to kick opponent's king away, it is necessary to gain the opposition, just like after king d5 and uh, after a few moves after king d6. Simply forcing the king going away and then get into important squares. In this particular case, they are e7 and c7. But in any other position, it might be different situations. So you can occupy different squares with different purposes. So you should remember that uh, gaining the opposition is the basic technique of grabbing the space and kicking opponent's king away from important squares. That's the idea. So the general rule is who gains the opposition benefits from it. Sometimes who gains the opposition wins the game. So in the king and pawn endgames, the value of each move is very high. Never forget about it. Use this knowledge over the board. Thanks for your attention and see you next lessons.